is Max Brooks. I've spent the last five years scouring the globe collecting the stories I present for you now. These are stories of fault, mistake, corruption, negligence, and fear. And while for some, these stories may be hard to digest, or in some cases relive, I believe these stories must be told. My hope with this is to pass down the human experience during the zombie war, so future generations can avoid the sins of mine. As I say these words, I am reminded of my existence as a member of a now endangered species less than half a million strong. And though the tide in this conflict has now turned in our favor, it is true folly to believe we won this war. We did not win this war. The human spirit thrives and daily grows stronger, but as I say these words, we still nurse the wounds of the past decade. Our spirit is weaker than any other time in recorded history, and if this war proved anything, it showed us the greatest flaws in human nature. In our arrogance, and in our false sense of superiority and belief in invincibility, for a time our home was lost to us. If this war proved anything, it proved that nothing will be all right ever again. The following interview was conducted in Greater Chongqing, China, between myself and the chairman of the local security council, Dr. Quang Jin Shu. It had been a quiet shift. I was grateful for that at first. Recently, we had had an increase in drunk driving accidents since motorcycles had become so popular amongst Chinese youth. I was tired and about to go out for a smoke and watch the dawn when my name was pitched. From what I heard from the receptionist's conversation on the phone, there had been an accident or an illness. It was an emergency, that part was obvious. They wanted help to be sent at once. How easy was the place to find? Not very. Officially, it didn't exist, and it wasn't on any map, which would explain why none of the younger doctors went. They couldn't be troubled to help some young men out of the goodness of their hearts. I regret saying that for once I agreed. Because, as I found myself driving there, I thought this had better be damned serious. Was it? Yes. I was ushered to the communal meeting hall, where seven villagers had been moved to cots. I remember thinking, of course they are sick. Damp walls and bare concrete. The villagers were clearly terrified. They cringed and whispered and kept our distance from the sick. What stage were the sick in? Most, if not all, were in the final stage before reanimation. All had a fever around 40 degrees centigrade and were shivering violently. If I tried to move them, they would all whimper. Also, all seven had severely infected the bite marks that were the shape and radius of a small human. I asked a villager how they had come across these marks, and she said that it happened when they tried to subdue him. Who is he? And to this day, I still do not know his name. But now he will be remembered as a patient zero. Wasn't he? Yes and no. The villager told me it happened when the boy and his father went moon fishing. What is? Diving for treasure in the ruins of the Three Gorges Reservoir. She said they were looting or just trying to recover some heirlooms from their old home. Apparently, the boy had come up crying with a bite mark on his foot. He hadn't seen what had happened. What about his father? He never came back. What did you do next? I called my old comrade from my army days, Dr. Gu Wenkui. He worked at the Institute of Infectious Diseases at Kongqing University at the time. We exchanged the usual pleasantries, then I told him about the outbreak and about the boy. I told him the symptoms, and then his, his face stiffened, and his smile died. He asked to see the infected, so I moved towards the nearest one, and held the camera so he could see everything clearly. After his inspection, he told me to stay where I was, to take the names of the, those in contact with the infected, to restrain the infected, and if any pass into a coma, leave and lock the room. He said support would be there in several hours. They were there in less than one. The patients were carried out on stretchers, bound and gagged. 
the boy was moved in a body bag. And as this was going on, the rest of the villagers were being examined for bites. How did you know the situation was so serious? Dr. Quay. He said something I had only heard him say once before, as that he tried to comfort a dying child. He told me everything was going to be all right. After he said that, I immediately called my daughter and told her to accompany her husband on his next business trip out of the country and to take my granddaughter as well and to stay as long as possible. The last thing I said to her was, don't worry, everything is going to be all right. Quang Jin Shu was arrested by the MSS and incarcerated without formal charges. By the time he escaped, the outbreak had spread beyond China's borders. This interview is conducted at a sidewalk cafe in Lhasa, People's Republic of Tibet, between myself and Nuri Talavaldi. The recent general election of the Social Democratic Party have left the streets overrun with revelers. Overland smuggling wasn't popular until the outbreak had started. For most, it was just too expensive, but with all the money needed for preparation and protection alone. I started out as an importer of rare goods, you know, raw opium, uncut diamonds, boys, girls, whatever was popular at the time. The outbreak changed all that. Did you know what they were fleeing? Only rumors. We had some small outbreaks, but the government hushed them up pretty quickly. Didn't the government try to shut you down? Officially, maybe. They made a good show of it. Harsher penalties for us too, stronger border checkpoints, all that stuff. They even executed a few of us who got careless. From the outside, it was all pretty convincing. Wasn't it? I'm saying it made most of us rich. Border guards, bureaucrats, even the mayor. We joked that the best way to honor Chairman Mao's memory was to see his face on as many hundred won notes as possible. Was it really that successful? My small hometown of Kashi became a boom town. Over 90% of all westbound traffic came through that small town. So, yeah, we did pretty well for ourselves. What about air travel? Just a little. I only dabbled in it doing small time jobs. So you don't know anything about the air smuggling? I didn't say that. Air travel was big in the eastern provinces. But you had to have money to fly, and you needed experience to pilot. I almost flew a plane to San Francisco. Then I could have just disappeared and waited it out. Why didn't you? Flight 575. In the early days, not many infected were on the planes, and if they were, they were only in the early stages. If you couldn't fool the Sutu, you couldn't fool immigration. That was the rule. Most people were hoping there was a cure out west. I heard this one story about a businessman and his wife. He had one of those slow burn bites, so they were looking for a cure in Europe. They got to Paris before he collapsed. The wife wanted to call the doctor, but the man didn't want to risk her deportation. He told her to leave. After two days, the staff decided to ignore the do not disturb sign and go in. I heard that's how the Paris infection started. Wait. They went to find a cure in the West, but they refused to call a doctor. Why go then? They were desperate. You would not understand. They had two choices. Get treatment from the government or succumb to their infection. If you had a loved one, a parent, a child who was infected, and you heard there was a cure out west, wouldn't you drop everything to save them? It was said, it was said that many Shatu propagated the myth of a cure. Some? Did you? No. Did you see many infected? No, not at first. The infection worked too fast, and land travel could sometimes take weeks. But later on, some tried risking it. That's when I started to see solitaries on my route. Were they dangerous? Not really. The ones I worried about were the ones in my car. Families would try to hide them. Some even tried shipping them, you know, in crates with air holes. <laughs> air holes. I didn't have a clue. What made you stop smuggling? 
there was this truck, a beat up jalopy. You could hear the moans from the trailer and many fists pounding on the aluminum so hard the trailer swayed. The passenger was some rich banker in a torn Armani suit with a desperate fire in his eyes. But when I looked at the driver, he had the same look as me. What was that? Money wasn't going to be much good much longer. The following is an audio log from the Royal Canadian Military from the radio of Stanley MacDonald. It details an investigation of a drug den in Kyrgyzstan. This is Stanley MacDonald with the Royal Canadian Military calling back to base. Do you copy? This is base. Three is loud and clear. What's the matter, over? We have a possible opium den at my location. It appears to be abandoned, but there are signs of a recent struggle. Permission to investigate. Granted, but proceed with caution. Over and out. What's the verdict, Stan? It's a go, but proceed with caution. No movement so far. Switching to infrared. The case with three ways. Maintain radio contact. Be advised, I may have found a light switch possible for whole compound. Copy. Roger that, buddy. Lights are going on now. Holy Christ. Be advised, there was definitely a firefight here. Pretty one-sided one, too. Over. What are you seeing, Tom? Over. I think I'm in the main chamber. There's a ton of blood. Severed limbs, too. It's like a pack of wolves came through here. Over. I'm in the storage area. I'll double back to your position. Stan, stay on your toes. Over and out. Shit. I'm at the end of my chamber. There is a cave-in blocking my way forward. Do you want me to double back to your position, Walter? Over. No need. It's more of the same. Whatever happened here, it's gone now. Nothing we can do for these poor bastards. Me is at the mouth of the cave and let's get back to base. Over. Roger that. Hold up, I have a possible survivor under the rubble. I'm going to try and dig him out. Over. Okay, we're heading to your position. Over and out. Stanley McDonald was told he was exposed to harmful chemicals and hallucinated. He currently lives in Meteora, Greece, searching for peace and trying to forget that night. The following was given to me by the owner and captain of the ISM Fingo, Jacob Nithy. In his email, he says it is a copy of a series of voicemails he left for his father. I'm almost home, father. It was a long day, but I got some money, so it wasn't a total... Father, I'm in a barber shop. I'm fine. I'll probably be late for dinner. Tell mother not to worry. I'll be home soon. Father, there are fires here. It isn't a gang war. It seems more like a military coup. Start packing. We should leave while we can. Father, the mob is coming from Zibanel Station. I'm not sure how I can get home, but I think everything will be alright. Father, run! Are you sure he has no bites? Positive. He is a lucky one, though, getting hit by that semi. Only minor contusions and a concussion. And with three of those things so near him, too. Yeah. Do you think it's true, what people are saying? That this is a new stream of rabies? Yeah, I could believe it. That's what it seems like, anyway. Has the morphine suck in your skin? This is not rabies, no way. Rabies doesn't do this to people. Well, what do you suggest? I have 15 possibly infected downstairs. What? The following is an audio file given to me by the Professor of Urban Planning at Khalil Gibran University, Saladin Kader. It chronicles the argument between himself and his father before they left for the Israeli quarantine. Father, I don't understand. Why do you want to go back? Because it will be safe. Israel will be the safest place for our family. No, it won't. It's a trap. Don't you see? It's a Zionist lie. African rabies is nothing. Their bastard leader is just showing how much of a coward he truly is. But Saladin, he offered us asylum. He said asylum for any foreign-born Jew and foreigner-born Israeli parents. 
any Palestinian living in occupied territory, and any Palestinian who lived within the borders of Israel. We could be safe there. No, we wouldn't be safe. Don't you see what this, is, what this truly is? The Zionists have just been driven out of occupied territories. They know the next blow will be the last for them, so they are trying to recruit Jews as cannon fodder. Well, I won't be a part of it. I won't be a human shield for those pigs. Son, I know it's hard to take in, but this is real. I was at the hospital, and I've been hearing things about this rabies outbreak. I don't think this is a ruse. We aren't safe here anymore. We need to take this opportunity so we will be safe. We just have to wait a little bit longer. Then we can return home as liberators, not refugees. Father, liberation is at hand, and you want to act like an abused dog and go whimpering back to your master. You don't get a choice, boy. I'm not going to stand here and be called a coward by you. You may not realize what is happening now, but I won't sit idly by waiting for the people I love the most to be overtaken by those damned demons. Now pack your bags. We're leaving tomorrow. The following was a radio ad that aired in the United States for the placebo drug Phalanx. All of this talk of rabies in Africa has me worried for my family. What if the pandemic spreads here? Well, aren't you on Phalanx? No. What's that? Phalanx is the newest in rabies prevention from Breckenridge, Inc. It's 100% effective against the rabies infection. Really? Where can I get it? Your local drugstore, of course. If you want to keep your family safe, Phalanx makes sure everything will be all right. Phalanx, shouldn't you be protected? The following is a series of voicemails left by the now mayor of Troy, Montana, Mary Jo Miller, to her late husband, Tim Miller. Hey Tim, you must not be home yet. I just picked up the Phalanx prescriptions from the drugstore, and I think we need to talk about it. I know it's supposed to keep the rabies away, but at $65 a month per person, it's getting a little ridiculous. Anyway, I'm walking home now. I should be there soon. Tim, I'm almost home, but I think someone's following me. Please come and pick me up. I'm two blocks away from the house. Tim, something is strange here. I'm very sure someone is following me, and I think I... I... Mary, we have to go. I've got the kids in the car. Tim, oh my god, when did you get a gun? Uh, this morning. Oh, come on, we have to go. It's all over the news. Why can't we go home? We can pick stuff up, but I've been seeing these things all day. I called my brother. We're staying with him. Tim, I'm scared. Don't worry. Everything's going to be all right. The following is an audio file from a traffic report in Memphis, Tennessee from the late Miranda King. And today's traffic report is brought to you by Phalanx Incorporated. Keep the rabies off your doorstep with Phalanx. Well, everyone as usual, the I-80 is as backed up as ever, but today it looks like Memorial Day started early. It looks like we have a ton of travelers today trying to leave Memphis. We have roofed off cargo as far as the eye can see. Oh, wait a minute. People are getting out of their cars and running. They are leaving, carrying children, backpacks. I, I, I think I even see some people with guns. Oh God, someone is just firing into the wave behind them, but no one seems to be hurt. I, I really don't understand what is happening here, folks. I, Wait, it seems that the horde has caught up to our gunman. He's firing into the crowd, but no one is going down. He's getting overwhelmed there. Oh my god, they appear to be eating him. That son of a bitch shot her gas tank. We are going down. What do you mean, going down? We are going down! Oh no, no, we're gonna cross right into the crowd! The following recording is of myself and Sharon Stell and her two caseworkers, Dr. Kellner and Dr. Summers, in Topeka, Kansas, at the Rothman Rehabilitation Home for Federal Children. It should be noted that while appearing like a full, fully grown woman, she currently has the mental capacity of a fourth grader. Good afternoon, Mr. Brooks. Can you say hello to the nice man, Sharon? Hello. Hi, Sharon. 
I'm very happy to meet you. Do you want to sit down? Yes, please. So, Sharon, can you tell me the story? All of it? Yes, please. All that you can. We went to church. Mommy and me. She said Daddy was coming, but he would be late. A lot of people were there. They had food, water, stuff. Some people even had a... What does she mean by that? She means they had guns. Go on, Sharon. There were other kids there. Jill and Abby and other kids. Mrs. McGraw was watching them. She had colors. They were coloring on the walls. Mommy told me Pastor Dan had said that was okay and I could go play with them. Pastor Dan was saying, don't worry everyone, everything will be all right. The authorities are on their way. People were talking on their... Uh, Cell phones. Uh, Keep going, Sharon. They were angry. They threw things and said bad words. Some were crying. I felt bad for them. Mommy was talking with Mrs. Cormode and the other mommies. They were fighting. She said, well, what if? What else can you do? I didn't like her. She was mean. Can I get some water? Of course. Jesus Christ, how long has she been like this? Well, she has been here for six years, but we suspect this state has lasted since that night. She shows signs of maturing, but progress is very gradual. She's been through and witnessed an extreme amount of trauma. We suspect that she spent most of the war on the run until she was discovered. We've been trying to help her uncover this trauma to help her heal, but as Dr. Kellner just said, progress is very slow. And we must be delicate as well so not to push her backwards into trauma again. Dear God, how old is she? We think around 19 or 20 physically, but mentally she is around 10 or 11 at the most. Sorry, I had to go to the bathroom too. That's fine, dear. So you were talking about a uh, Mrs. Cormode. Yeah, I remember. That's when I heard someone yell, they're here. People started jamming the benches in front of all the doors. Quick, jam the doors. Does someone have any nails? They're in the parking lot. They're coming this way. Who was coming? Show him, Sharon. Uh -oh. Jesus Christ! <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. No. No, it's fine. I just haven't heard that. For a long time. I didn't mean to, um... I'm sorry, Sharon, that was just a very good impression. I, I, I think I just need a minute. Has she always been able to do that? Yes. It was worse in the beginning when she just did it randomly. A security guard, Todd Wayno, almost shot her out of reflex. He was at Yonkers. Todd Wayno. He's here? Do you know him? Yeah. We were at the Honolulu conference together, and we were in the same platoon that retook New York. How is he? Well enough, but don't push him. He's fragile enough as he is now. Just the mention of those things sets him on edge. He almost shot her the first time he heard it. She didn't understand. We've had to soundproof her room because she still sometimes does it in her sleep. Yes. She has fooled many people in this ward into thinking a corpse is walking around here. She understands how it's inappropriate now, however. But I suppose I should have warned you. Yeah, I just haven't heard that sound in a while, and it's not one you like hearing. Are you fine to continue? Yes. I'm so sorry, Sharon. Let's continue with no more interruptions. Okay. They were coming. They came bigger. <gasps> they wanted to come in. <gasps> People were screaming. Mommy held me and said, everything will be all right. Mommy won't let them get you. Brace the door, hold it! <laughs> all the windows started to break, the lights went down, the grown-ups started to scream. Should I do the other one? 
Yes, Sharon, it should be fine. They're getting in! Shoot them! Mommy said I won't let them get you, not like Daddy. <coughs> I don't let them get the children. I won't let them get you! I won't let them take you! <coughs> All I remember after that is someone taking me outside and telling me to run, Sharon. Run as fast as you can and don't look back. The following is an interview with Arum Farinakian, the wife of Ahmed Farinakian, the pilot who blew up the Ketch River Bridge. My husband, Ahmed Farinakian, he dropped the bombs on the Ketch River Bridge. He wasn't attacking Pakistan. He was defending his country. You don't understand. There were swarms of refugees flowing into India daily, millions just trying to find safety. And it wasn't that we were unwilling as a country. It was that we had our own outbreaks to handle. We couldn't close the borders and quell our own outbreaks at the same time. We, we just couldn't. His actions would have allowed us to get our house in order so we could help others. Could you detail the precautionary measures India and Pakistan had in place to prevent? I, I don't know much more than anyone else. Honestly, if my husband were here, he, he would be better suited for this. It's all right. Take your time. What I know is that there were all of the possible safeguards in place. There were hotlines between both capitals. The ambassadors were on a first-name basis, along with the generals, politicians, anyone involved, really. All to ensure that the day they feared most would never come. Ahmed would always say, It's not perfect, but as long as it works, who cares? <laughs> Why didn't the safeguards work? Why do you think? Those precautions were put in place to guard against political upheaval or an extremist gaining power. There weren't guides on how to prevent war when the dead don't die. We did our best. We followed orders and look where that got us. My country is in ruin. Everything I ever had is gone and I had to watch my husband as he was ripped to shreds. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did he end up turning? No! It wasn't those cursed demons! My husband was killed by Pakistani refugees for blowing up that damn bridge! They blamed him for the war, the nuclear bombs, everything! He was vilified for doing his job and trying to save his people. It's not his fault none of us can ever go home again. I'm sorry I didn't know. And to have an American, of all people, bring up the falters of my people. Let's look at Yonkers, shall we? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have yelled. It's just, I lost so much. Mrs. Saranakian, with all due respect, every person still alive today lost everything they ever knew. We all saw loved ones taken from us, and we were all pushed beyond what any one person should go through. But your loss is no more significant than mine, and mine is no more significant than yours. In the wake of all this, all who live today are truly equal. The following is an audio record from a New York news outpost at Yonkers, New York. It directly precedes the Battle of Yonkers. Hello, I'm Michelle Thompson here with Susan Danvers, now reporting live just north of New York City at the military encampment in Yonkers. We have Dwayne Bronson, the on-ground commander here for a brief interview. How do things look today, Mr. Bronson? Well, honestly... Not too good. We have reports that a massive horde of African rabies infected civilians is heading up north. Our job today is to keep them from spilling into the rest of the United States at large. It seems you brought up the big guns today, sir. Do you expect any trouble from what some are starting to call the undead horde? <laughs> no, ma'am. We have the latest in militaristic developments here with us. There is no way this horde, as you call it, could possibly overtake us. I'm not going to lie. Some innocent people will be going down, but we can't risk this plague spreading anymore. If these people were only taking phalanx... Are you on phalanx? Damn right I am. Every soldier here is. We are treating this entire event as a hostile invasion. Don't you worry at all. Everything will be alright, I swear. The U.S. military is out in full force today. We can no longer afford to pull punches. And if I may address the public directly... I urge you all to stop this mass hysteria. 
There is no Armageddon that could possibly breach the shores of our great nation. The threat is insignificant compared to our raw strength, honestly. So stop eluding, stop playing from your homes. I am here to tell you that you are all 100% safe. And when this is all over, we will start to repair the damage this infection has done to us. Tomorrow, this will all seem like a distant nightmare. Commander Bronson, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we need you on the front lines. The mass is moving forward. We need to strike now. Thanks, son. Duty calls. You two, please retreat to a safe location. Well, there you have it, folks. Everything will be fine. But rest assured that Susan and I will be interviewing the soldiers after the battle. Now, back to the studio where Diane has some great tips on how to make your Easter even more festive. The following recording was given to me by Todd Wayno of the United States Military. It details the battle strategy of Yonkers, New York. Thanks for getting me out of there, Todd. I couldn't bear those lights for much longer. Is your radio on? Yes, sir. We have live feeds directly to the White House and the Pentagon going as we speak. Oh, so the land warrior system is up and running? Yes, sir. Good. Todd, you look worried. Permission to speak freely, sir? Granted. Why the hell aren't we up on the rooftops? Wouldn't it just be easier to keep this simple and keep the destruction to a minimum? I mean, we are firing on New York City. It's abandoned, I know, but people still have homes here. Look, kid, this isn't just for efficiency. Why do you think I did that interview just now? Our real job here is to show that we are still the best. No one has been able to stand up to this thing. Everyone before us has either hidden or fallen. We are the United States military. We don't fall. We push others back in their place. Son, we have the entire might of the U.S. military behind us. We have more tanks here than we did in the entirety of World War II. We have Bradleys, Humvees, armed with every conceivable ammunition made. We have Stingers, the AVLB portable bridge systems, XM-5s with the latest in electronic warfare. And just in case, we even have a last resort if they start flowing in too fast. And that isn't even mentioning what you boys will be outfitted in. You're covered in body armor for God's sake. And you have the best in terms of heavy weaponry the world has to offer. There is no way in hell that the front line is going to break. But sir, what if it does? Past the front line, no one else is in any sort of armor. And with all the reporters crowding the streets, how can we make a retreat if needed? What did I just say? We will not retreat because there will be no need to. No force on earth can stand up to the full might of the United States military. Now, Todd, Hell, Alec, and Kevin. I need to let them know what the plan is. Yes, sir. Alec, Kevin, you guys reading me? Loud and clear, Todd. Same here. What's up? Commander Bronson wants to tell us the battle plan. They're on, Commander. All right. We're going to start off with the big guns first. I'm talking heavy rocket fire to slow them down. That should take out the biggest chunk. Alec, I want you on the west side artillery. I'm putting you in charge there. Kevin, same goes for you on the east. Todd, you are taking the center. You will all be behind the barricades on 2nd Street. Your job is to take out any stragglers. I'll be calling out the big guns from our base. This will be an easy day, boys. No casualties. Now let's show off what we've been holding back. Yes, Yes, sir. sir! The following is an audio excerpt from the Battle of Yonkers, New York, from the mic of Todd Wayno. Fair warning to listeners for graphic noises. down, boys. I'd say about 36, sir. There were 50 before, though, so not all bad. Good to hear. Well, boys, it's your time to shine, and remember, you're on camera, so don't choke. (laughs) They won't go down. I repeat, they won't go down. We have to retreat. Hold the line. I'm out of ammo. Same here. Oh, shit, we are being overtaken. Requesting fire. Oh, my God, get it off me. Get it off. Get it off. Oh, fuck this! We're retreating! We're retreating! Ah! Alec! Kevin! Come in! That is a direct order! The east and west ends have been overrun, sir. I don't think... Ah! 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 Calm down, Todd. It's me, Kyle. Kyle? Yeah. As soon as things went to shit, I grabbed the nearest thing that moved fast and headed your way. 
we are gonna get the hell out of Dodge, man. Don't worry. Everything will be up. Wayno of the United States military to anyone who might be listening. New York is gone. Massive casualties. If anyone is there, please respond. Please respond. World War Z Part 1, Everything is Going to be Alright, features the voice talents of Dominique Francis, Wander Boyges, Eric Corbin, Rachel Kostrana, Reese Bradel, Thomas O'Shea, Tyler Tyke, Brandon Meyer, Spencer Richardson, Jacob W. Phillips, Amy Rogers, Shawnee Hubble, Galen Molk, Jimmy Levins, Jimmy Dix, Kyle Sanderson, Kaylee DeVincenzi, Jeremy Vick, Nolan Kenmuth, Alyssa Matthews, Henry Steelhammer, Chrissy Steinman, Aaron Garber, Keisha Campbell, Nicole Bruno, Tamara Mathias, Laurel Livesey, Lucas Donart, and Joni Hansen. Sound designed by Annette Roggenbuck and Galen Mulk. Directed by Jacob W. Phillips, assisted by Kyle Sanderson. <laughs>